It's a very complex question because I think there are many different facets to who I am. Firstly, I'm an ordinary Zimbabwean, very ordinary uh, in the sense that my age group, a lot of people who are my age, they've got a very similar background. We grew up in a, a country which was run discriminating our people, as you know, black people. Therefore, we were excluded from a lot of what was going on in terms of determining the quality of life, the aspirations of our people. It was that kind of society. At a personal level, I grew up in a family that was a peasant farming family. And therefore, again, everything I did was typical of any Zimbabwean who came from that background. You wake up in the morning, go and work in the fields before you went to school, typically. Come back from school and then the chores would either be you go and head cattle, go and uh, fetch firewood, go and fetch water, or go back into the fields and work. That's the kind of uh, upbringing I had. Very typical of a lot of, I mean, as I describe it, I think a lot of Zimbabweans are going to say, oh, that just sounds like me. <laughs> Probably eating wild fruit, as you had at cattle, playing with other kids out there because we literally made our own entertainment. It's fascinating how life has changed. Your age group, I mean, like you, you're very much younger than me, and I think your age group look to other people providing your entertainment, other people making your toys. We made our own toys. We made, literally made up our own games. We were out there in, the, in nature eating wild fruit. We grew up in a very natural, integrated with nature kind of life. Uh, life. Well, I grew up in a family, in fact, a, a large family, a family of eight. So we're a large family in, the, in that respect. You could, I mean, as a child within that family, I was not a one, a, an only child situation. So yeah, I grew up in a family. So I've always had the framework of what it is like to grow up in a family and progressed from there. Lot of speculative stuff in terms of attribution, but I think some of the things which stick out, I would suggest, in the, in the peasant farming, farming background I describe, you tended to grow up like a soldier, literally, in certain elements. So the, if you, time to wake up arrived for you to go, because the program then got very regimented. If you wake up late, the chances are you're going to be, you're not going to be let off without finishing the morning chores before you can go to school. So it gets you into trouble. By the time you get to school, if you've not been following the almost rigid program, you're going to get to school late. And you know what used to happen when you do <laughs> it. So, so you, you sort of programmed yourself to understand, you work backwards. If I am to avoid the corporate punishment at school, I must give myself time to complete all the chores before I get there. Which means when, it's like when the bell goes to say, get up and go and do the following. You get up and go and do the following in order to finish them on time too. Yes. I was born in Berengwa, in the Midlands. My father is from the Midlands. He's a Karanga, Roji actually. My mother is in Como, and she's in Debele as a result, yeah. Interestingly, my wife is from Mutare. So I often joke that I'm a tribal colored. <laughs> and I think it always, again, in uh, so that there is no misunderstanding. Is that exceptional? The answer is no. I, I do not know why. I wish I was a better student of history, but if you go to the Midlands, most of the people in the Midlands, in Zimbabwe, will speak both languages, Shona and Debele. So there must be a historical explanation as to what that turned out to be like that. So again, I'm not exceptional. I'm typical of Zimbabweans who come from that particular part of the country. In terms of my schooling, because I think there is an element of something I must have absorbed from my education. After my uh, standard four, because this is the old grading system, I, I went to a Catholic school, Don Bosco. So I started interacting with priests, Catholic priests, 
quite a lot. And I think a lot of my value system has borrowed a lot from what I saw and experienced in terms of how they interacted with us. They appeared to me to be very focused people, people who meant the, both the, the priests and the nuns. Yeah? They appeared to really care about people. I think that's what my memory of them are people who dedicated themselves, literally gave their lives to improving the lives of other people. I think that's what I experienced as a young person growing up. I went, I, I spent uh, four years at a minor seminary, uh, a school called Chikwinguija Seminary in Gweru, just outside of Gweru. So that was an intense interaction with Catholics. Before that, I again spent two years, standard five and six, uh, at Don Bosco, again under the influence of Catholics, and I think admiring how they appeared to dedicate their lives to the service of other human beings. From there, I went to St. Ignatius for another two years. And I would say, my, I mean, I, I can identify a particular individual. The guy who was our, the priest, who was our headmaster, Father Barry. Very measured man, very, somebody who exercised authority, not from being authoritative, but it sounds like a contradiction. He was very accessible, very self-contained, uh, but he made you feel that you were okay, no matter, he was your boss, so to speak, your, your big boss, headmaster, but he never made you feel that he was overbearing at all. So it was a kind of leadership which I felt very comfortable with, accessible, but yet ex giving you the impression of knowing and being able to guide you without being overbearing. That would suggest a, a deliberateness, a consciousness which I don't think I want to claim at all. But when I think about people who I would say I would like to be like that person, Father Barry always comes up in my mind. Always, without exception. I think, you know, again, people uh, have their own take on uh, different individuals. But in the modern era, I would say, President Mandela, maybe let me actually start <laughs> controversial. I think that President Mugabe, in some elements of, let's, let's go back to 1980. I think President Mugabe showed us as a people that you should not let history overburden how you position yourself in the current environment and how you try to create a platform for the future. That, that's how I would characterize what happened around the transition. He exercised, I think, incredible wisdom. He did not let himself be uh, emotional about the relationship between the blacks and whites. He was very pragmatic. So I would put him as one of the people in that particular phase who I think Zimbabweans ought to actually pay attention to how he managed our transition. Following that, I think Mandela in South Africa in many ways took a leaf out of what Zimbabwe had done. Therefore, out of what President Mugabe had done. Because he then went and did exactly the same. Not necessarily for the same reasons, because their journeys had not been the same. But I would say again, as we navigate very problematic transitions, we, we should use these examples as markers as to how we can be guided to try and create a future that is different from the past without being overburdened emotionally by that past. And then I would say I found uh, uh, President Obama fascinating because again of the circumstances here to navigate, first black president in a society that has got lots of issues, both in terms of the historical facts of the black history in the US, slavery and the like, and therefore the descendants of those societies, navigating a, a very problematic space. But I think he did it amazingly well. Lots of lessons for us to learn from the maturity, the level-headedness of leadership 
which does not allow itself to be burdened by the problems of the past. Keep that. It allow it informs you, but you should not let it be a burden. I, I suppose it, it, all, all these things depend on which particular facet of life you look at. So the people I've named, they've tended to come from political leadership because I think political leadership tends to give us the basis on which we really build everything else. But I think in looking at our own people, it's a slightly different facet of life. Look at uh, the achievements of somebody like Strive Masiwa. Quite amazing. I mean, when Strive, when I first met Strive, he was still working for the PTC in Zimbabwe. And we became very close, actually. We would, I still remember, we used to go cycling together. One of the toughest cycle, sort of cycling trips we did was to Mazowe Dam. You can imagine, I mean, I can still see cycling back. I do not know whether you remember, when you come out of Mazowe, the incline coming up is, is just killing. And it's etched in my mind <laughs> of those kind of experiences. And then look at what Strive uh, went on to do. We, we played a very small role as Standard Chartered Merchant Bank and I personally in helping him confront the challenges of the initial phases of uh, Econet. The whole fight with government, the supporting the project, we played a, a minor role, a, a role but not, not nowhere near explaining what later on became of Econet. So one has to get these things in balance. And then if you go further afield in terms of continent, you go to Nigeria, Dangote and what is achieved. Again, now I'm looking at the business community. But let me go back into uh, lead African leaders. I had the privilege of meeting on a one-to-one -one conversation with Meles of Ethiopia. Fascinating man, fascinating. In terms of his clarity of what his country needed, the ability to navigate what often is treacherous grounds actually in terms of how you lead a country, within an environment where other people and other countries who are supposed to partner you have got their own views and often try to force you to do things their way as opposed to your way. And the Meles gave me the impression of somebody who mastered the art of combining his clarity for his country with how to navigate in a, in a, not, in no, in a non confrontational way with would-be partners and accepting that if he failed to persuade them, he would have to go his own way and accept without rancor that they had a right to choose to work with him or not to work with him. Yeah? And I had been led to go and have that conversation with Meles by a very close associate of his, and that's President Kagame, who is another example, a living example today, of navigating very difficult terrain this issue of there is a history you have to manage, but there is a different future you want to build. And don't let the, few, the past burden you and blind you in some respects from seeing more clearly how to construct a future that is fundamentally different and hopefully secures your people from any threats of that past being repeated. So these are, 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 are I think, some fascinating examples. And of course, from textbooks rather than from meetings, Lee Kuan Yew inspires me <laughs> in terms of just the challenges of where he started from and they built a modern country in one gen pretty well, let's say two generations, but actually one generation. Quite amazing. Circumstances which looked impossible, but he got it done. When I talk about uh, my upbringing, I, I've just told you about uh, peasant farming and so on and so on. It's, it's very uh, tough uh, for, for children. Remember the, the modern concept of child labor, which does not exist in our cultures. Because remember, that we teach children by letting them participate in the everyday work that we do. That's how we teach our children. But I think it also deprives them of being children in some respects. It makes them accelerate taking on responsibilities probably earlier than they should and they miss out on a proper childhood. So that's, that's not an easy childhood. It's not romantic at all. It's, it's quite tough. From there, I think one of the most challenging ones would have been... So after my A-levels, 
I applied for a place at UZ, then got accepted, yeah. No, maybe before that, actually, before that. So after my A-levels, my sister organized for me to get a job, which was clearly meant to be a holiday or vacation job before going to university. And I went to Blauayo. And I worked in a retail shop in Blauayo. And, the way, and I also recall that at that point, our society was characterized by how different racial groups related to each other. We had a hierarchy in Zimbabwe. We had blacks at the bottom, and then somewhere as a buffer, we had both Indians and what we call Kalans in, in our part of the world. Yeah? We, we, in other parts of the world, they would be just called black, so black people. But so we had a buffer of Kalans and the, and the Indians in between. And then, of course, the whites as the ruling class. And I happened, and I don't think I want to be too granular about this. So I was working for an individual who came from one of these buffer groups. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. And, and the treatment that I received was not, not pleasant. And in fact, I, I refused to accept. So I lasted just one day. I did that job one day and I left. I, yes, I left. And then, as if to create a contrast, so I'm not going to stick just to the low moments, as if to create a contrast, I then got a job with the Ministry of Water Development in Arare. And I had a white boss, an, an elder, elderly gentleman who had come, I think, from Scotland, actually. I just cannot remember his name. And it swung to the other extreme, very professional, very caring, very fatherly, mentoring. So it was almost like a contradiction of the stratification that I had experienced. Yes, somebody coming from the class that's supposed to be the superior class, therefore would treat you like nothing. But he, he went and exa did exactly the opposite. And I still remember that when I decided to leave that job to go to university, he was very disappointed. Not, not because he didn't have aspirations for me, but I think he, we had developed a relationship he, which made him feel it was a loss to the department. But I went with good memories of that particular experience and still decided to leave and go to university. Yeah. So, but there will be many more, many more examples of uh, times when you are, you are really challenged. I mean, given our history, I, I, I lost a sister during the war. And that loss, my sister was very young. She was only 12 when she was shot. She was shot in cold blood. And this event was a low moment for me and for us as a family. It was a particularly low moment for my mother. They were very close. And it literally almost destroyed my mother. But thankfully she got through it, yeah. So many, many of these, yeah. This question gets asked very, very often. And the, the first problem is that I'm not so sure that I can explain to you whether there was a particularly deliberate management process to my journey. So just being absolutely open about this. I think the only thing I'll, I tend to be able to isolate in concrete terms is that I tend to be a person who applies himself to whatever I'm doing. I tend not to worry about the next stage. So what I tend to say to young people is, often in managing a career, people make a mistake. They worry about tomorrow and start overlooking things that they should be doing now. Yeah? So my, my own advice tends to be that young people ought to focus on executing on their current responsibilities to the best of their ability. Because when you do that, my own view is that the world is watching. They are watching not your dreams, they are watching your current reality. And they are informed not about your dreams, but they are informed by how you do and execute on your current responsibilities. That's the only concrete guidance that the world has on who you are and what your approach to work is. And when you do that, it gives you credibility which is grounded on reality, not on promises. So that's, that's my advice, is when you get responsibilities, execute those that you currently hold and do that to your best ability, because everything else will follow. You, 
you know what? I again I explained in our casual conversation earlier on that I tend to be a half full kind of personality. I think the one characteristic about me which maybe will disappoint a lot of people is that when when something is out of reach, it looks very attractive and and uh, uh, aspirational. When I get there myself, the magic disappears. You understand? So typically, let's illustrate it through academic uh, work. If I'm standard, in standard four, standard six students or pupils appear to be really smart, they've managed to get there. When I get there myself, the magic is not there anymore. <laughs> and this is tended to be the case, I think, so that whatever people think I've achieved, to me, it does not look like an achievement. Because if I could do it, then it must be achievable and ordinary. Remember, I told you about my experience of Catholic prisoners. I think there is something admirable about changing other people's lives rather than just focusing on your own. For me, that would be an achievement, making a difference. So in many respects, maybe I taught for a little while. I taught at the University of Zimbabwe. And from time to time, I meet people who are my students. And they say, ah, oh, you taught me. And you see, these people have become something. And I think that actually gives me a lot of satisfaction to have made a difference to other people's lives. In order to answer that question, I think we'd have to go back. Why did I go in in the first place? Why did I accept the invitation to get into cabinet? It's, it's a very good, the question you asked earlier on, what, what do I aspire to do? And I told you to make a difference to other people's lives. So when I was invited into cabinet, I thought it was an opportunity to really contrib contribute, contribute to making a difference to what I perceived at the time was already a, a country going the wrong way. I, I told you earlier on about President Mugabe in 1980 at the transition point, I think was guided by what he, he wanted to do as opposed to what had happened in the past. As the 90s came to a close, I think we started drifting into actions which were guided by history as opposed to inspired by a future we wanted to build. Yeah? So for me, the invitation was attractive because I thought I was being invited to participate in creating that future which would make a difference to Zimbabweans, Zimbabwean lives. When I got into cabinet, very quickly it appeared to me the tensions in the country and in cabinet, in the top team, were beginning to shift our focus much more to being guided by what had happened. And what had happened was problematic as you all know. It was bloodshed and the mistreatment of people. And at the minute we began to be guided in terms of our plans and executing those plans by almost like a revenge mentality, I felt I just could not contribute the way I wanted to contribute to creating a country that was different, fundamentally different from that past. So you, you can see the contradiction. I was attracted in to make a difference and when I got in, it became clear that that's not the direction we're headed in. We're now headed in a, almost like driving a car but looking in the rearview mirror. And it, it, I knew then that I had no role to play. I spent something like one and a half, two hours on a one-to-one -one with President Ngabe the day I left, explaining I respected him and I, I felt I owed him an explanation as to why. I thanked him for having given me the opportunity to join the cabinet. I thanked him for having allowed me to have a little bit of an insight into his personality. And I know this is controversial. I still maintain that actually President Mugabe did care about Zimbabweans. But I think where he fell short would be in the areas of management managing people, giving them guidance, making it clear what his own intentions were and guiding his team towards that. 
I think he allowed bad people within his team to completely divert the agenda. I mean, the number of times we've heard him even more recently complain about things which do not make sense. I remember one of the things which really stuck in my mind. There was an occasion when somebody in the UK was sending donations to Zimbabwe. Either it was books or second-hand equipment or something. And the customs people insisted on having duty paid. These people in the UK were sending, Zimbabweans, were sending stuff for free to go and help the lives of people at home. They spent their own money to send this stuff to Zimbabwe. And then what the country did was to turn around and say, you have to pay duty for taking the trouble to send stuff to make a difference to your own people. And I remember the president complaining, say, saying, I do not want to be known as a president who does things like that. So, but for me, the challenge then was, but you are the manager, you are the chief executive. Why are, are you allowing this to happen? So I try to make a distinction between his own inclinations and then that separate that from his management skills. I just don't think he had very good management skills. But I think his intentions for Zimbabwe, especially in the earlier stages, I'll continue to be criticized for saying this, I know, but I think it would be wrong of me not to acknowledge the good things that I felt he did, the good elements of his personality. Then I, I, I suspect if I am not capable of doing that, I'll not be capable of building a, good, a better Zimbabwe. So, so I think I think again this is it's good to put this to juxtapose the question. If you left at one point, what makes you want to go back? Okay, it's, it's an obvious question that arises. I was invited to join cabinet as a minister. I did that and came to the conclusion that in that role, I had very little influence on how the team performed on how the team was molded together, on how the team was guided in the formulation of the agenda. I was a minority of one. Why would I want to go back and run for president? First thing is, I don't think there is an argument that the country has continued to go the wrong way. The quality, and how do I measure that? Simply the quality of life of our people is deteriorated immeasurably. The economy is not in a good place. I think the experience I've gathered in terms of the real economy working in the private sector, both in Zimbabwe, on the African continent and globally, gives me some of the tools which I think would make a difference. The may, maybe the major part of why now and why for head of state rather than just participate as a minister is this issue of what is your role as the manager of the team? you've got much more leverage in guiding the team in terms of what needs to be done compared to when you are just one of the players, so to speak. And especially if most of those players believe in something that has led us to where we, we are. If you are the head of that team, the first thing is you've got an opportunity to choose how the team itself is constructed. Yeah? It's something that I believe that I can do and do with an eye to getting on board the team that will really make a difference to Zimbabwe. A team that will be based on the skills that the people already have, the track record that they have, and therefore their demonstration of, of capacity, because I think that's what Zimbabwe needs. At the moment when you look at what we've done, other than the very first cabinet that Zimbabwe had, in between I think we've done down, gone downhill, we've tended to appoint people to positions of responsibility not just at cabinet level, but all the way through the administration on the basis of loyalty to a political party. I think we need to break loose of this and look at Zimbabweans and what they're capable of and appoint them into positions of responsibility as professionals. That's what we need for Zimbabwe to change. Professional people given responsibility for them to deliver on the basis of what they can do not on, appoint them on the basis of who they know, who they are friendly to, who they are loyal to. We have to break loose, and I think we can do it. I mean, I, I think it's such a contradiction. Globally, including in this country, look at how many Zimbabweans you find 
in very responsible, very senior positions. They, we are everywhere, except in our own country. We have, I mean, we can change this. We can become a Singapore of Africa easily. We've got the skills. And that's why that I would like the opportunity to demonstrate it's absolutely feasible and it can be done. In very short measure too. You know, I, I think a, a very, um, almost like flimsy in terms of touchy-feely issue is just respecting people. I think we need to change our attitude towards each other and learn just to respect each other. Because I think out of respecting each other, how we then interact with each other, what we do for each other will also change. We'll, we'll then have an attitude of servant leadership, if you like, changing the lives of people because I care, because I respect. It's one of the things, and I think from a position of leadership, although it sounds like touchy-feely, but I think from a position of leadership, you can very easily begin to make your citizens think about how they interact in their daily lives with everybody else. And when you do that, the way they do their job, the way they have show respect towards everybody in society, no matter their station in life, will influence every, everything else that happens. But some of the more obvious, more concrete issues, I really think we need to get on top of corruption. Just corruption is a cancer. And it uses resources so completely inefficiently for a society. And I think we need, again, to demonstrate from the top that corruption is not necessary. Corruption tends to be driven by people who get desperate. I mean, other than at the top. At the top, it's abuse of position. Lower down, it's failure for the state or society and institutions to deliver. People start then finding their own solutions for solving their immediate problems and they will then tend to resort to ways which are not the right ways for society. So if you lead by example and also eliminate op op opacity, so make things transparent yeah, and make sure that those who are in positions of delivering services to the community do just that so that the people who are supposed to receive those services don't get, de get desperate and start finding other ways and shortcuts to get to their goal. Get that done the way it should be done and remove the desperation. Once we make our society operate like that, I think that Zimbabwean's energy and the imagination and the innovativeness will then go back to where it ought to be. At the moment, a lot of that is still there in our country, but it's being diverted into solving these problems I've just articulated. Navigating all the blockages that are being put in place by people who are supposed to be facilitating for you. They deliberately put blockages in order to catch you out. So your energy now goes to trying to solve that as opposed to contributing real value to the community. Hmm? So I would put a lot of emphasis on what, what makes an economy work. In the clarity that to make your own economy work, you are you, you navigating a very delicate balance between cooperate and compete with the rest of the world. You are not, people are not sitting out there just wait, waiting to come into your country and put resources and so on and so on. They are weighing up opportunities that are available in your country and elsewhere. You are in competition. So you need to be acutely aware of what will make people choose to come to you rather than go to the next door country. Yeah? So don't, don't be naive and think people love us and they'll come to us irrespective of what we do. You have to attract them into your... So in order to do that, you, you have to invest in getting to know what is it that puts them off and what is it that attracts them to my country as opposed to another country. That's the first thing. The second thing is also to understand that resources come out of a functioning economy. The amount of resources you have to invest in making an administration strong, making your hospital strong, making your education strong, 
have to be generated from somewhere. And where is that? It's in the real economy, the productive economy. So without minimizing the importance of all of these other things, you have to understand the sequencing that is necessary. You create the resources and produce them in order to then deploy them, deploy them in all these other areas. We've tended to invert this particular relationship. We are spending a lot of money in paying civil servants, for instance. We've got a bloated civil service. But we keep almost like strangling the economy in order to feed this, as opposed to inverting and saying, let's create the resources, and from that, let's see how much of that we can afford to put into capacity building in terms of the civil service. That's the, the way it should be. How much can, should we put into building and maintaining the infrastructure that allows the rest of the economy to grow? That, that's the, way, the right way around, yeah? Grow the economy, make it create excesses or surpluses, as these business people would say, which then give me the latitude or the room to invest in other things, yeah? So that's the economy is primary. Our country today, unfortunately, is very divided. We, we've become very tribal, tribally sensitive, regionally sensitive, and so on and so on. I would like to say that that is a failure in leadership. Any community that is divided is going to expend an inordinate amount of energy fighting within itself. We need to get into a situation where the community is cohesive because they see a common agenda and they've got common objectives and common aspirations so that we work in a, a streamlined way, if you like, in a, a way that is joined up in order to deliver these objectives that we now hold in common. So we need to unify our country. How do, how do you get a citizenry to have confidence in the space in which they operate, in their institutions, in their government? I think you need to respect the frailty of humanity. All of us are flawed. So I think we need to create our own, our own institutions, which we put in place because we are sensitive or alert to the fact that when human beings are presented with certain circumstances, they will fall short of ideal behavior. So the issue of corruption that we talked about earlier on. You, we shouldn't be too idealistic and unrealistic about who human beings are. That realism allows you to put in place the so-called checks and balances institutions, risk management. Risk management is born out of recognizing that the human, human animal, if you like, will often take advantage of weaknesses in a system to exploit it to its own benefits in that, rather than that of society. So you put checks and balances not because they are imposed on you by somebody else. You put them in place because you appreciate, you are pragmatic about human nature, and you own those, human, those checks and balances. Once you do that, it, what does it mean in, in real practice? There are certain institutions which we should put in place which protect us as citizenry against those rogue elements amongst us. So we own this, we own it. So if we have a judiciary that fulfills this role that everybody can believe in, and which we know is safeguarding us as a collective against bad elements within our society, if we have a police force that is put in place exactly to do the same thing, if we have an army that is there exactly protecting the broader citizenry, against either external or internal malfeasance and misbehavior. We need to own this, but we need to structure them in such a way that they are not captured by any particular element. They are structured in such a way and they are run in such a way by people who've got the characteristics that are going to keep these things true and neutral and using only the constitution as their guiding instrument for how to perform their roles. Yeah, I would do that. So those are the key elements. Attitude towards each other, a functioning economy with the right prioritization and relationships, institutions of state which are genuinely confidence building and protective of bad behavior within our own society, unity, 
to in order for us to work as a united society with common objectives.